Saints for Home and School, 2. St. Gertrude, 1256 to 1301 or 1302, the Herald of Divine Love, Feast November 16th. St. Gertrude was born in the province of Saxony, Germany, on January 6, 1256. Nothing is known of her birthplace, nor of her parents, neither is anything known of her death except that it occurred in either 1301 or 1302 at the convent of the Cistercian nuns at Hefta in Saxony. Probably she was an orphan, for at five years of age she had been placed in the convent under the care of St. Melktide. There she remained all her life. She was a clever pupil, applied herself carefully to her studies, learned Latin perfectly, and became a great author. Many of her writings are lost, but fortunately the world still possesses her book, The Herald of Divine Love, in which she tells of the visions granted her by our Divine Lord Himself. But many saints had visions. Why, then, is the life of St. Gertrude of particular interest? It is because our Lord favored her in a special way. Through her he prepared the way for St. Margaret Mary, who would later spread devotion to the Sacred Heart. That is why St. Gertrude is called the Herald of Divine Love, a herald being one who goes ahead to announce the coming of the King. And so, from a peaceful convent in a quiet town, our Lord raised to heroic heights of sanctity a simple, unknown little girl, told her many secrets of his Sacred Heart, and asked her to teach others the wonderful things she had learned. One day Jesus appeared to her and said, In my right hand I hold the gift of life, and in my left hand the gift of sickness. Which will you choose? Divine Lord, Gertrude answered, Give me whatever pleases thee. Do not consider my wishes at all. I know that what thou dost choose to send is the best for me. What virtue then should be placed on suffering? All the saints looked upon it as a gift which brings great merit. Moreover, it is better to bear the sorrows God sends. It is the most dangerous kind of impatience, says St. Gertrude, if a person desires to choose his own sufferings. Whatever is given to him by God is the best. What then, if sickness comes, our Lord said to St. Gertrude, When man, after applying the remedy of his suffering, patiently bears for love of me that which he is unable to cure, he gains a glorious prize. At another time Jesus said to her, If a man can, with the help of grace, praise and thank God in time of suffering, he obtains a treasure from the Lord, because thanksgiving, when sorrow comes, is the most beautiful and precious crown of the soul. Every tear shed on the death of a friend or a relative St. Gertrude learned, earns a rich reward if offered to God in obedience to his holy will. The deep sympathy our Lord shows for the sorrows of men was thus revealed to her. The depth of his love was shown in the saint in several visions. One day she saw Jesus during Holy Communion placing beautiful white robes on some of the sisters, precious jewels shaped like violets, and giving out a delightful fragrance, adorned the robes. A rose-colored garnet with golden flowers was also given them as a sign of Christ's passion and his infinite love for man. Our Lord wishes people to pray for the souls in purgatory. He once showed St. Gertrude a table of gold on which were many costly pearls. The pearls were prayers for the holy souls. At the same time, the saint had a vision of souls freed from suffering and ascending in forms of bright sparks to heaven. To her was granted the privilege of seeing our Lord's sacred heart. The graces flowing from it appeared like a stream of purest crystal water flowing over the whole world. These visions continue to the end of her life. Jesus said to her at the last, Come, my chosen one. I will place in you my throne. Nothing is known of her actual death, nor the place of her burial. These details do not seem to be important, for she lived unknown to men, that she might be better known to God. 
Yet she left to the world an abundance of spiritual joy. Our Lord himself revealed to her that those who read with devotion her book, The Herald of Divine Love, will receive an increase of grace and consolation. St. Elizabeth of Hungary, 1207 to 1231, daughter of a king. Feast is November 19th. This is the story of a beautiful princess who lived in a castle long ago, but it is not a fairy tale, for the princess was real and the castle was real. The name of the princess was Elizabeth. She was born at Pressburg, the old capital of Hungary, in the year 1207. She was the daughter of King Andrew II and Queen Gertrude. At her baptism, she was carried to the church under a canopy made of the richest cloth to be found in the country. From her earliest days, she was the delight of her parents. Her first words were prayer. And almost the first thing she did was an act of kindness to the poor. Even when she was only four years of age, her sweetness of character was such that people even in other countries had heard about her. 350 miles from her home was the castle of Wartburg, near the town of Ischenach in central Germany. In this castle lived a duke named Hermann, head of the province of Thuringia. He had a son named Louis, who was 11 years of age. The duke sent messengers to the court of the King Andrew, asking that the little princess Elizabeth be betrothed to Louis. It was the custom at that time for parents to arrange marriages for their sons and daughters, even many years before the children were old enough to get married. The king and queen of Hungary consented to the betrothal. It was a time of sorrow for them because the little princess, only four years old, had to be sent to that country with the messengers. With many tears they said goodbye to their dear child, and she was taken away to Wartsburg Castle. There she was carefully looked after by nurses and teachers, placed over by Duke Herman. In church one day she saw a large crucifix. So full of love for Christ was she, that she took off her crown. How can I wear a crown of gold and jewels, she said, when our dear Lord wore a crown of thorns? When Duke Herman died, five years later, Princess Elizabeth had to suffer much. She loved to visit the sick and the poor. No road was too rough or day too stormy to keep her from going on some errand of mercy to a wretched cabin. Because of this, another princess said to her one day, You are not fit to be a princess. You should be nothing but a servant. It isn't proper for a princess to wait on common people the way you do. These and other insults Elizabeth bore without ever saying any angry word in reply. After a time, Louis returned home after he had been trained to be a knight. What? His people said to him. Surely you're not going to marry Elizabeth. She isn't fit to be your wife. She won't act like a princess at all. She ought to be sent back to Hungary, where she belongs. No, answered Louis. Princess Elizabeth is noble and beautiful. I am betrothed to her, and I shall marry her. In the year 1220, the wedding took place with great rejoicing. Everyone remarked what a handsome couple they were. Louis was tall, good-looking, and manly. Elizabeth was young, beautiful, and sweet in every way. They understood each other well and were very happy together. Their life was quite peaceful. They loved each other tenderly. Elizabeth liked prayer and penance and wished to continue her charities. Louis allowed her to do what she desired. Whenever he was away from home, she dressed in poor garments. But when he returned, she dressed in beautiful clothes to please him. Often before she went to a party, she did penance. Yet she appeared cheerful and happy, even smiling. God does not wish us to have sad faces, she used to say. When she was at home, she ate little. One day, Louis returned to find she had taken nothing but bread and water at her meals. He asked her to take better care of her health. She told him to taste the water left in a glass from which she had been drinking. To his great astonishment, 
he found that it tasted like the very best wine. Elizabeth was not satisfied with giving money and food to the poor. She knew that God wants us to sacrifice ourselves as well as our money. So she went herself to wait beside the sick beds of many a sufferer. She cooked the meals, cleaned the houses, and even dressed the sores of her patients. One day she carried into the castle a small child suffering from leprosy and laid him on a couch. In horror at the sight, the ladies called Louis to show him what his wife had done. Louis looked at the poor leper, but saw instead the Christ child himself. One day, while returning from the woods, Louis met Elizabeth carrying food in her mantle. Let me see what you have, he said tenderly. To his great surprise, he saw not bread, but the most beautiful red and white roses. It was in the winter when no flowers grew. At the same time, he noticed a beautiful cross in the air over her head. He took one of the roses and went on his way. It is said that he kept the rose for the rest of his life. Great sorrow was now to come into this happy life. The knights of Europe were called to fight the Turks in the Holy Land. Louis heard the call and took the Crusader's cross. Imagine the scene when he said goodbye to his dear wife and the three little children they had. Elizabeth felt she would never see her beloved husband again. If anything happens to me, said Louis, my knights will bring you back this ring. He left for the Holy Land in 1227, but before the end of the year, he had died of fever. He was buried in the seaport town of Otranto in the heel of Italy. His knights returned with his ring to Elizabeth. Her sorrow at his death was intense. In her agony, she cried out, O oh Lord my God, the whole world is now dead to me. But thy will be done. After this she was put out of the castle. The people of Ishnak were forbidden to shelter her or her children. An old woman she met while crossing a stream on some stepping stones pushed her into the water and said, There, that's where you belong. When you were a princess, you wouldn't act like one. I wouldn't stoop to help you out either. That was the thanks she received, she who had done so much for the poor. She had to give up her children. She had to beg her food from door to door. But at last the Emperor Friedrich proposed marriage to her. She refused this offer to be an empress, saying that she had promised God to serve him and him alone for the rest of her days. Then her husband's body was brought back from Otranto by the knights returning from the Crusades. When this sad day of his funeral was over, the knights restored Elizabeth to Wattsburg Castle. She was given also the revenues from the city of Marburg, but refused to take any of the money for herself. She ordered it all to be used for the poor. She even built a hospital and nursed the patients herself. She lived a life of poverty in an old cabin, where she followed the rule of the Third Order of St. Francis. By command of her confessor, she gave up the joy of seeing her children, and also parted from two of her dearest friends. The loss of all she held dear was more than made up, however, because our Lord and the Blessed Virgin appeared to her frequently, bringing her the sweetest consolations. At last our Lord came to take her from this world. With a look of tenderest love, he said to her, Come, my beautiful one, my beloved, to heaven. At midnight on November nineteenth, 1231, she passed away, being then only twenty-four years of age. She who had sold the world had gained everlasting bliss. So numerous and so wonderful were the miracles following her death that she was canonized in 1235. Only four years later, her father, her mother, and three children and many relatives were present at the canonization to hear the voice of God through his church declare her a saint. St. Francis Xavier, 1506-1552, Apostle of the Indies, Feast December 3rd. St. Mary's Church, Aramapusha Mananam 
P O, Travancore, South India, April fifteenth, nineteen hundred, Master Jack McCabe, thirty ninth South Street, Windsor, Ontario, Canada. My dear Jack. Many thanks for your kind letter of March tenth, in which you sent me two dollars for my mission. I hope God will bless you for your kindness. It will interest you to know that many Catholic people of India owe their faith to Saint Francis Xavier. The province of Travancore, where I live, was one of the first parts of this country in which the saint preached the faith. About five hundred miles north of here is the city of Joa. Where, his body is preserved. Although the saint has been dead nearly four hundred years, his body is still incorrupt, meaning it looks exactly the same as when he passed away. Recently, the casket was opened. The silk veil which covered his face, of the saint, was lifted, and the features were found to be perfectly incorrupt. A number of photographs of the remains were taken, and then the body was rewrapped, sealed, and replaced in its silver casket. Would you like to know the story of this saint, who had been called the greatest missionary since the days of the apostles? In the year fifteen o six, he was born at the castle of Xavier, near the city of Pamplona, near far south of the Pyrenees Mountains in Spain. His father and mother, members of a noble family, gave their children a very good education. All of his brothers became knights and trained themselves to be leaders in battle. Francis, although a good at- athlete, was more inclined towards books. Accordingly, his parents sent him to the College of Saint Barbara in Paris, where he made a splendid success of his studies. He obtained his Master's of Arts degree. And then became a teacher. In fifteen twenty eight, Francis met a Spaniard named Ignatius of Loyola, a very holy man who wished to form a society wholly devoted to the salvation of souls. Often he would say, "What will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul?" At first, this saying had no effect on Francis, for he was very ambitious and proud of his learning. He hoped to make a great name for himself in the world by becoming a great scholar and enjoying the wealth of his parents, that they would give him soon. Ignatius was kind to him, praised him for his cleverness, brought scholars to his classes, and even loaned him some money. This kindness made Francis think a great deal of Ignatius, and the two became close friends. Ignatius kept repeating. What will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? At length, Francis paid more attention to these words and began to see the foolishness of depending too much on the things of this world. His thoughts turned more and more towards eternity. Soon, his life was entirely changed. In the year fifteen thirty four, he joined Saint Ignatius and four other young men, who made vows at Montmartre. In Paris, to visit the Holy Land and work for the conversion of pagans. If this were impossible, they decided to offer their services to the Pope and go wherever he should see fit to send them. This was the beginnings of the Society of Jesus, commonly known now as the Jesuits. In fifteen thirty six, three more young men joined them, and the nine companions left Paris to go to Venice. This. Entire journey was made on foot and during the coldest of weather. There, Francis employed his time waiting on the sick in the hospitals of the incurables. He worked day and night, dressing the sores of the patients, making their beds, and serving them with greatest charity. He then went to Rome at the request of Saint Ignatius to ask the blessing of Pope Paul the Third for their intended voyage to the Holy Land. The Pope received them favorably and granted their request. They then returned to Venice, where Francis was ordained priest in the year fifteen thirty-seven. Before he said his first mass, he spent forty days in a poor cottage about four miles from Padua. There he suffered much from the cold because 
He made his bed on the ground. He ate only a few scraps of bread that he begged from the neighbors. After his first mass, he was sent to Rome by St. Ignatius, where he met a messenger from the king of Portugal. The king wanted six missionaries to preach the faith in India. Two missionaries were chosen, one of these being Francis Xavier. He left Rome with the Portuguese ambassador on March 15, 1540, to go to Lisbon, where they would take a ship to India. The journey was made by land over the Alps and the Pyrenees Mountains, and took more than three months. When they came near the city of Pamplona, the ambassador said, Father, do you not think you had better go to the castle of Xavier and say goodbye to your mother? No, replied the saint. I must continue on my journey. It is sad indeed to not say goodbye to my dear mother, but parting from her world be even sadder than if I do not go to see her. I hope that I shall meet her in heaven. On April 7th in the year 1541, Francis set sail for India. More than a year after, on May 6, 1542, he landed at Joa. His first call was on the bishop of that city, who told him that the pagans of India seemed more like beasts than men, and that very few ever accepted the faith. Francis spent the mornings comforting the sick in the hospitals and visiting those who were in prison. After that, he walked through the streets of Joa, ringing a bell and asking the little children to come to catechism. They gathered in crowds about him, and he led them into church where he taught them our holy faith. After a while he began preaching in public, and before long the whole city was converted. He then went to the south of India, near the island of Ceylon, where he performed many miracles, thus converting thousands of pagans. In other parts of India also his miracles and his preaching brought large numbers to the faith. He raised no less than four dead persons to life. He returned to Joa in the year 1543 to find a supply of men who would help him in his missionary labors. In my own province of Travancore, he baptized 10,000 people with his own hands in one month. At one small village in this province, he found that very few were converted by his sermons. After a short prayer, he told some of the people to open the grave of a man who had been buried the day before. He commanded the dead man to arise in the name of the living God. The dead man arose and appeared not only living, but in perfect health. Another day, he met a funeral procession in which a young man was being taken to the cemetery for burial. Francis raised him to life. These miracles made such a great impression on the people that the whole province of Travancore was converted to the faith in a few months. Many other parts of India wished to have him come to them. When he could not go himself, he sent other missionaries, who succeeded in converting many thousands of people. In the year 1548, he went to the island of Ceylon, where he converted two kings and many thousands of their subjects. St. Francis once chanced to meet a Japanese. From him he learned the history of Japan, and as much as he could about the different religions there, he decided to go to Japan. He landed in that country on August 15, 1549. There he converted many thousands of people. God assisted him by giving him the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is where you can speak many different languages through the gift of the Holy Ghost without knowing in your mind what you're saying. God assisted him by giving him the gift of tongues. He also performed many miracles, the greatest miracles of all being the raising to life of a young girl. On November twentieth, 1551, the saint again returned to India, and from there sent other missionaries to take his place in Japan. He also heard about the great land of China and wished to go there on a mission. At that time, Christianity was forbidden there, but St. Francis hoped to find some way of getting into the country. While on the ship going to China, he became very ill of a high fever. 
At his own request, the ship stopped at the island of Xin Chin, off the coast. There he disembarked and went into an old cabin, which, however, was a very poor shelter because it was open on every side. A doctor who came to attend him to his illness was not able to do anything for him. A few days later, on December 2nd, 1552, the saint passed peacefully away. His last words were, In thee, O Lord, I have hoped. I shall not be confounded forever. His body, which remained entire and fresh, and giving out a sweet perfume, was placed with great ceremony on a ship and taken to Joah. On March 15th, 1554, the holy remains were solemnly placed in the church of St. Paul. Many miracles took place during the funeral procession. Blind persons recovered their sight. Others were cured of diseases, and many cripples received the use of limbs. The saint was canonized by Pope Gregory the Fifteenth in 1622. He was given the title Patron and Protector of all the countries in the East Indies. Now, Jack... The next time I write, I shall send you some pictures of St. Francis of Xavier and of the places he visited here. As this is our summer season, the heat is almost unbearable. I often think how much the saint must have suffered in these climates. Perhaps he had to watch out for snakes, too, just as we do now. Yours sincerely, Father Sebastian Pinacat.